Look at what I found, an old book of sayings. Let me read you some, starting from here. As the head perfects the body, the prince, the city, the jewel, the ring, so the husband perfects the wife. And it is hers to obey, not merely to his orders, but to his silence as well. <laughs> Let me read another one. This one. By turning water to wholesome wine, Jesus implied that women, like water, imperfect, incomplete, must transmute herself into the wine who is her husband, serving him, obeying him, subjecting to the will and whims of a good husband. Quite a point of view, and a very old one, essentially what men thought of women in the Renaissance, a foundation of the women's status at the time. Women had it hard. Nevertheless, we do know of early opposers of these views. Cardinal Ottavio Colonna, a cousin to poetess Vittoria, pleaded his contemporaries to awaken the fact that the physiological inferiority of women was a cultural dogma, not a fact of nature. Perhaps, as far back as the Renaissance, the winds were beginning to turn. The female body was, in those years, the matter from which to mold family agreements and settlements among royalty. A marriage meant far more than a treaty of peace. Every young woman was to be married into another family without even being consulted. She was, since childhood, raised to expect it. Um, marriage was a, a method by which one created alliances with other families. Um, even among the lower classes, Marriage was a way in which to create alliances, professional alliances, either within a, a particular guild. So women were not, or women, girls at this point, were not allowed uh, to choose what they were going to do, what they wanted to be when they grew up. Uh, it was determined for them by their families. And no family could ignore the worth of Giulia Farnese, the most beautiful woman in the world. She lived to be a wife in words only, a lover for the sake of power. To our eyes, she is, more than anything, a lovely adolescent girl. Climbing over her dreams, the Farnese rose to the heights of power. The mark I bear to this day, weighing me down, is that of the matrons of Rome and of the courtesans, who in their sloth and gossip, carrying bastard children, still looked down on me. Fourteen. I was but fourteen. The most powerful man in the world wanted no other than me. I knew nothing. I fancied being valued so. I knew nothing. I was led on, ill-advised by those who were meant to protect me from the holy damned city. To roam the riches of the world flow, and the miseries of its people stagnate. In such a place, ambition knew no shame. In Rome, Giulia became a pawn in the dangerous game which marked her family's ascent. Through her writings, we know her to be an educated, knowledgeable, refined girl, as were many noble women of her time. It would be preferable by far to school women in scholarly research. For such activities busy the soul. Not only would this be a balm against laziness, but a means to transmit all the precepts to young women's minds, leading them to virtue. Noble families almost always had tutors for their children, 
and um, in, the, in the very best noble families, and if a father was uh, allowing it, their daughters would also be educated. Um, the Farnese women, for example, were educated. And they weren't just educated in um, church texts or um, texts in the vernacular in Italian. They were also learning, some of them were learning Latin and Greek and were studying up until the time that they married. Uh, classes, the, the lower classes, there was a much greater uh, percentage of men than women who studied, and they studied um, different things. Uh, women were, um, abaco was one of the most common things that they studied just in terms of basic mathematic functions. Um, and that was certainly more present in cities like Florence, merchant cities, rather than in Rome. Um, and women were studying primarily te uh, texts from the church and lives, uh, the lives of saints and things like that. Um, it is through education that we have a slow, um, a, a, slow, a, a slow movement whereby women uh, are conscious of their, um, their state and their position within the, uh, within the family, within society. Uh, we see that in their writings because they begin to note and uh, it's primarily through a literary debate that took place beginning in the 15th century called the Querelle de Femme, the woman question, which asks a number of different issues about what the role of women is, what the role of men is, um, what women's rights are, uh, whether they could rule or not. And it's through that debate that we see women slowly um, emerging and beginning to contribute to the debate by writing their own text. It's, it's through um, the works of people like Moderata Fonte, Arcangela Tarabotti, earlier Christine de Pizan um, in, in writing in French. Um, also, culturally, we have to remember the role that literature played at the time. Um, it was very much of a card, a, a sort of a, an entryway into um, high society was that of, of, of writing literature. Castiglione himself says that everyone has to write poetry and everyone has to, uh, in order to judge that of others, everyone has to learn how to dance to judge the dancing of others. Um, so that the, the, the phenomenon of writing um, literary text, uh, mostly poetry, in, 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 certainly in the 16th century it's mostly poetry, was one of entering into good society. One sent one's text to others almost the way now I suppose we send photos. Um, and uh, because of this we have, it, it's thanks to the very full archives and libraries in Italy that we have a lot of these texts. What freedom could there be for married women? As daughters, they were forcibly exiled to another household, then bound and subject to the social standing of their husbands. Uh, there was no possibility for a woman to stay at home um, with her family and not marry, even if her family, you know, even if she wanted to marry, but her family couldn't afford to marry her. A marriage, of course, meant a dowry. To have a daughter was a serious cost for a Renaissance family, and costs kept rising, to the point of becoming a, if you will, financial issue. Because there was a huge problem at the time of dowry inflation, these girls were um, at four or five years of age, it was decided that they were going to, to marry, and there were funds, communal funds that were set up, organized by the city. Uh, these girls had a set of money, a bit of money was set aside by their family, and uh, it grew and grew, and then they took that money with interest if the girl lived. If the girl didn't live and died, that same uh, amount of money was left in the fund, which helped pay for the high interest rates that they were offering. The girls who um, did marry uh, would marry at a very young age, usually around somewhere we would say between 13 and 15 was pretty much the average marriage age for a noble girl. Um, 
these girls would oftentimes there was a huge disparity in age between the girls noble girls who were marrying and their husbands usually somewhere around 10 to 15 years if the husband died uh, before the wife uh, which was oftentimes the case wives could um, oftentimes did die in childbirth that was um, one of the ways in which women um, often died at the time but if um, she was lucky enough to have her children or many children and then her husband died she would um, then have the opportunity to decide what to do with her dowry because her dowry was her inheritance from her family. If you intend to be a good wife and live in peace, sign this covenant with your own self. My husband is above me and beyond me. He holds authority and governs me. Nature gave him this right. God gave him this right. Um, there were plenty of women who went to convents because they wanted to devote themselves to God. There were also women who were there who absolutely did not want to be there. And they were put there because their families simply could not afford to, to pay their dowry. There are many stories of excess daughters being devolved to the convents, locked away against their will. There is one in the Farnese dynasty as well. Her name was Margarita. Because of a physical handicap, she was deemed unfit for marriage and forced to take her vows. Most revered and honored Cardinal Alessandro, the tests which the Lord places in front of us are also signs of his unspeakable greatness. Believe me, neither this cloistered life nor the poverty of the convent fluster me, but the absence, the indifference indeed of my own family, my brother Ranuccio, and my very own father, feeling no compassion for my state, looking upon me as an obstacle in the way of the future greatness of the House of Farnese. Now my name is Sister Lucenia, and you are the only one who still remembers Margarita. Such a lively child. I used to hide inside my father's room, as all children will. I would hear his voice and feel secure. To the world, he was a great leader, but to me, he was my father. The benefit of going into a convent was that one could continue to study. Um, normally girls were educated up until the age that they were married. Once they were married, they, or the ones who at least were educated, then afterwards didn't have the possibility of continuing their education. It was very rare that they would continue to study after their marriage. So convent life was very active with um, painters and playwrights, uh, nuns who were putting, they were putting on performances for other nuns. The phenomenon of forced claustration gave um, impetus uh, to a number of different writings on the part of nuns, um, some secular, um, some of them religious, uh, but of all sorts. And the very phenomenon of forced claustration we see expressed most forcefully in the work of Arcangelo Tarabotti, who denounced it in um, a number of different works. Um, the problem of forced claustration uh, was, was one that uh, eventually was curbed with the uh, reforms that were instituted by the Council of Trent. Um, Trent was very much aware of issues related to free will in general. I mean, it was part of the Reformation in general, discussed free will and uh, self-determination, even within marriage. I mean, many of the marriage rules um, that we know now were formulated during Trent. They did not exist before. Before it was a very different affair to get married and how one married was very different than what we think of it today. No use denying the world's oldest profession being practiced widely during the Renaissance. Practiced regulated and contrasted by numerous monks who made the conversion of prostitutes their personal mission. A 
apparently with little success given the number of streetwalkers in Rome. Pietro Aretino calls Rome the land of women. The reason why was that demographically Rome uh, was uh, enormously skewed in favor of men. Out of this uh, phenomenon grew um, the presence of uh, a very significant population of prostitutes in Rome. Um, the two most important cities for prostitution in Italy during the Renaissance was, were Rome and Venice. And Rome had uh, among its legions many, many women who were many who were coming also from far away, um, not just from, even from outside Italy. Uh, one of the most famous, Isabella de Luna, was actually a Spanish woman. Prostitution was at the time a clearly recognized role in society, with its own internal hierarchy. Some were courtesans, enjoying particular privileges, and entertaining noblemen in visit to the holy city, aristocrats, and cardinals. Their choice of profession was not dictated by need. Their favors were much sought after. Women who actually had um, studied quite a bit and who served as escorts, served as um, companions, dinner conversationalists, uh, women who had read Latin, studied, they wrote poetry, um, the idea of exchanging poetry, exchanging one's literary works was very much a part of uh, the cultural capital that was in use at the time. And it's thanks to these works that we have still a record of uh, many of our most um, prolific writers were, were courtesans. In this milieu, Pasquino, the collective voice of the people of Rome, organized a defamatory campaign of gossip, half-truths, and hearsay to destroy the reputation of a particular woman. The victim of choice was Clelia Farnese. Tongues were wagging in Rome, and it went more or less like this. When she was married to Giovan Giorgio Cesarini, she decided to become a woman of pleasure, a courtesan. All right, her husband was old and she was young, but she remained the daughter of Cardinal Farnese, two great families uniting. This is what marriage is for, the bear with the lily, two households united, and she was an adulteress, an adulteress! Oh, what are you saying? Do not believe that Roman gossip. It was a plot. Cardinal Ferdinando de' Medici fancied her, courted her, and made all Rome believe that he had had her, only to spite the other cardinal, his enemy. The truth is, they both wanted to become Pope, and poor Clelia was caught in the middle. I was present at the horse races Cardinal de' Medici organized in San Pietro in Vincoli. I saw with these very eyes the attention, the dedications he made to pretty Clelia, with her husband sitting there. A scandal. The Cardinal wanted all to believe he had taken Clelia. That's the truth. If you say so. But the rumors in Rome say otherwise. When she ruled over Sassuolo in lieu of her second husband, the Duke, she proved wise and honest, so say the chronicles, and this is just one of the many details of her life uncovered by scholars from all over the world. So as part of the Querelle de Femmes, one of the arguments was particularly that of women's rule. We have numerous instances in Italy from the Middle Ages on, really even from the late antique period, of women who ruled their state, ruled their city, ruled a region. Um, they normally never ruled because of inheriting the right to rule. They ruled as um, a regent for their male son, who had, had maybe was, was a minor at the time. Um, one of the most famous, for example, is Caterina Sforza, who ruled in Moli and Forli for 13 years before her son took over power. Certainly a woman may rule, but most women are romantic, silly, immoral, voluble, gossipy, lazy, indecisive, brainless, inconsiderate, weak, careless, impulsive, and proud. Giulia Farnese um, thought very highly of her citizens and it was very clear that um, she took care of the citizens of Carboniano because we see it in her last will and testament. She set aside 
uh, numerous gifts, pigs, or dresses, um, beds, uh, various kinds of sheets, um, which were real commodities at the time, were worth a lot of money. And she set aside for many of the poorer women of uh, the town of Carboniano and um, for many of the daughters of servants of hers as well. She took care of them. Ah, the Renaissance. Renaissance of arts, peoples, politics, religious beliefs. Renaissance men building the sumptuous palace of the Tusha. And what about the women? Many now study their letters and documents, shedding new light on our collective history and raising new and more questions. We are still discovering every day. We discover new things, especially by women authors, that through you know the centuries had not been recognized as such. So that has been, um, it's a very rich time to be working on women's writing. For decades, the women of the Renaissance, the Farnese and many others inspired their contemporaries who sang them and portrayed them in masterpieces of exquisite beauty. Now they inspire scholars and researchers all over the world. Joan Kelly in an article entitled Did Women Have a Renaissance has po posed a question that scholars have been looking at for the past 40 years. Um, and the question is, do we want to rethink the periodization that's called the Renaissance? Did, did women have a Renaissance? Or was the Renaissance really just for noble men? Um, the same question has been asked for other, other marginalized peoples, let's say, whether it be for servants or for people of color, etc. cetera. Um, the question of whether women had a Renaissance or not has many answers to it, and I, and I don't think there's any kind of agreement as to what the final answer might be. We do recognize, though, that over time, there, has been a, there was a slow, through the centuries, from the 15th century on, recognition on the part of women themselves that they had a greater deal of autonomy than that they had had in the past, and that greater deal of autonomy they exercised it through education. It was education that gave them the opportunity to change their own lives and to change their own possibilities. Obviously, in order to have an education, one has to have a certain uh, amount of money to pay for it and a certain amount of leisure time. Um, and those certainly were elements that helped create the Italian Renaissance. It was, we know it because there's a rise in literacy, um, there's a rise in disposable income. In that sense, women were able to, to take part of that renaissance. And it's through women's writings that we see a slow recognition of the fact that things are changing for them and that by expressing uh, their ideas about themselves and what they have access to and what they can change and what they can do, that it's by rendering those things public and making them public and making other people aware of them that they can in effect change their own lives. Women and men were equally endowed with the gifts of spirit and reason and with the faculties of speech created for the same purpose. And the sexual differences between them did not ordain them to different fates. Women were not the only ones to awaken to such realizations. Slowly but surely, philosophers, men of letters, artists, and even the clergy began to change their perspective on women's conditions and on their potential. No longer seen as monstrous mishaps of nature, but as intelligent human beings searching for a new way to navigate the world. From then on, to our time and beyond, the search continues.